Don't you have a sense of the presence of God with us this afternoon? As we seek God in prayer and as we open His our heart to Him, He comes and those angels come. I can just picture those angels surrounding our loved ones that we've been praying for right now. Here we are kneeling at a campground in Tranquility, New Jersey, praying for people in Newark and people in Trenton and people in New Brunswick and people down in Atlantic City and we're kneeling here praying and praying for people in New York and people throughout New England and throughout the United States and maybe in other parts of the world and we kneel down and pray and just now God has said to the angels of heaven, heaven, go, 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 go and the angels begin descending touching hearts, touching lives right now something is happening because you prayed that wouldn't happen if you did not pray. So that's our first lesson in witnessing. What time is it? Oh, we have a little time left for the class, so I can teach you a little bit more. Is that okay? All right. Okay. So, three steps in witnessing. The first is praying. The second is caring. And the third is sharing. Now, you say it's praying. I know, but I changed it so it rhymed. Praying, caring, and sharing, you see. So we have to do some praying, we have to do some caring, and we have to do some sharing. Adventists are very, very strong on doctrine. That's good, but it also has its liabilities. Seventh-day Adventists have very high standards. That's good, but it also can have its liabilities. Now, let me tell you what the problem is. You can never share until they know you care. All of the sharing without caring is like taking seed and planting it out here on the pavement. So it is not who, it is not only what, witnessing is not only what you say, it's who you are. Have you ever noticed that somebody can say something to you and you will accept it and other people can say the same thing and you won't accept it? Some people can say something to you and you say, that's right. And another person will say the same thing and you'll say, that's wrong. You husbands and wives know what I mean, don't you? (laughs) You know what I mean. There is something called earning the right to be heard. Often, when a woman wants to witness to her husband that doesn't know Christ, I'll be at a meeting like this, and the woman will come up to me and she'll say, Pastor Finley, do you know of any good book I can give to my husband? I'm about ready to say, Sister, you've been trying that method for the last 42 years, and it hasn't worked. You've been trying to give him 57 books. You think the idea is to convince his brain. But if you win his heart, his brain's going to come along, so go after his heart and you'll get his brain. See? I had parents say to me, my daughter, my son has drifted away. Um, You think, could you send them the Bible course and it is written? I mean, sure, we'll send them a million Bible courses. But God may want to use you. God may want to use you. Jesus was so effective in sharing because he cared so deeply. Probably the best illustration of that in the Bible, at least a classic illustration, if not the best, is John, the fourth chapter. Now, John 3 and John 4 are contrasting chapters. In John 3, Jesus witnesses to Nicodemus. In John 4, the woman at the well. Look at the contrast between John 3 and John 4. In John 3, Nicodemus was a man. In John 4, she was a Woman. Well, that's not too brilliant of an observation, is it? John 3, Nicodemus is a Jew and she is a what? Samaritan. Nicodemus is a respected Jew and she is a woman of ill repute. Nicodemus is wealthy and she is poor. Nicodemus stumbles upon Jesus at night. She finds Jesus at noon. You go through the story and it's a story of opposites, a story of contrasts. But it's a story that tells us that Christ's love is large enough to embrace the whole world. He reaches religious, self-satisfied, pharisaical Jews, as well as Gentiles living lives of ill repute. 
Jesus' approach to the Nicodemus and his approach to the woman were dramatically different. Jesus confronted Nicodemus with the claims of the gospel and he looked at the self-satisfied Jew and he looked him in the eye and he said, you must be born again. That startled Nicodemus. Jesus didn't use that approach for the Samaritan woman. And I'd like to look at this story in some detail in John chapter 4 as a model of working with people that are wayward. The interesting thing about it is Jesus did not condemn the Samaritan woman. She had seven husbands already. We probably would have had difficulty allowing her to come into the church. But she had seven husbands already. The church board would have been called and would have said, let's look over her history, her background, her past. Let's see if she's worthy. It was kind of interesting that Jesus didn't do that. Didn't do it at all. Very fascinating when you look at Christ and the way he worked with people. Now, let's look at the story. There are some hidden things here that I need to show you. John chapter 4. It says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus, verse 1, made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, Christ was getting too popular. The Pharisees were going to kill him. Verse 3, he left Judea, Judea is in the south, departed again to Galilee in the north. Verse 4, but he needed to go through Samaria. Now, Jesus did not need to go through Samaria to get from, the Galilee, from Judea to Galilee. I've been to Judea, I've been to Galilee, traveled many times. There's three ways you can go. You can go up the Jordan River, that's one route. That's uh, on the West Bank. You can go up the Mediterranean coast, that's a second route, or you can go through the center and go through Samaria like Jesus did. Jesus did not need to go through Samaria to get there. He needed to go through Samaria to get that woman. So when the Bible says he needed to go through Samaria, it wasn't to get from point A to point B geographically. It was because there was a woman there and Jesus went where she was because she wouldn't come where he was. And Jesus always goes where we are. The ladder always reaches where you are. Jacob's ladder isn't 10 feet above you and you keep jumping to reach it. The ladder comes right where you are. Whatever your need is today, that's where Jesus goes. Jesus goes where you are to take you where he is. He always comes to us where we are. One of the key points in working with people is to understand that God is working in ways in their hearts and minds that you and I will never understand and he's ministering to them where they are in the cultural context that they can understand. He's working in ways that may not be the traditional ways that we would think, but God is working in their lives. Verse 4, he needs to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that gave to his son Joseph. Now, two things about this. First, He's in Samaria. This is Gentile territory. Jews don't go into Gentile territory. Gentiles and Jews were people of other races. So here you have a story of Jesus breaking down racial divisions. Not only this, it says he came to the town of Sychar. The word Sychar means drunkenness. So Jesus comes to the place of Samaria. No Jew would ever go to Samaria, but he goes to the worst city in Samaria, the worst town in Samaria, the town of drunkenness, the town of wickedness, the town where a woman who has seven husbands would feel comfortable settling. Then the Bible says, verse 6, Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore being wearied from his journey sat by the well. It was about the sixth hour. And a woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to him, give me a drink. Don't miss it. It's the sixth hour. Jesus is in Samaria, the worst place, the town of drunkenness, and he says, I thirst. Was there another sixth hour when Jesus said, I thirst? What time is the sixth hour? Twelve o'clock. See, they reckon time from sunrise. So the third hour would be nine. The sixth hour would be twelve. So when Jesus is on the cross from the third to the ninth hour, he's on the cross from nine to three. So the sixth hour, Jesus hangs on a cross. And as Jesus hangs on a cross on twelve o'clock noon, a cross between two thieves, he says, I thirst. 
And so the thirst that Christ had in Samaria was simply reflective of a deeper thirst he has for the souls of men and women. Jesus longs for people to be saved. He longs to have them with him for eternity. And Jesus is constantly saying, I'm thirsty. Thirsty for the souls of men and women. Thirsty that they come to me. Thirsty that they find my love. I hunger after them. For Christ, it is always the sixth hour. It's always high noon. The high noon when he thirsts for the souls of men and women. Now his disciples go to bring food. And then Jesus, now notice, it's very interesting. Verse 7, a woman of Samaria comes at noon. Now all the women normally came in the morning, the coolest part of the day. They came to draw water for the day. Nobody's going to come at noon. She's quite startled. And Jesus says to her, would you be so kind to give me something to drink? And the woman is so startled. Verse 9, she says, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritan. And Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you'd have asked him for living water. The woman said to him, sir, now notice, first in verse 9, she says, oh, you're a Jew, you're a Jewish gentleman. Verse 11, she calls him, sir. And then notice what happens, you go down. Then she gets the idea that, that he's a teacher and she comes down. Again, calls him sir. She tries to get him involved in some religious argument in verse 20. She says, our fathers worshipped on this mountain. You did you say we ought to worship here? And Jesus goes on to her, woman, I say to you, it's not whether you worship on this mountain or that, but you've got to worship the Son of God. And she says to the him, oh, I, the Messiah is coming. Verse 25. And finally, she goes down and accepts him as Messiah. She leaves her water pot. She runs. What opened this woman's heart? Christ tenderness. His kindness, his compassion, his interest in her. Your daughter, your son, is never going to be interested in what you are interested in unless you're interested in what they're interested in. They're not. They're not. All of your attempts to win your son or daughter, all of those attempts are not going to work unless they know that you're interested in what they're interested in. But you say, what they're interested in, I'm not interested in. Find something that they're interested in that you can get interested in, even if you don't like to do it. Find it. When I was 16 and 17 years old, I was not an Adventist Christian. I was attending a Catholic church. I was brought up in a Catholic home. And during those years, I had not a lot of interest in the Bible, to say the least. I was interested in basketball. Loved basketball. Played on a basketball team, great basketball players in the City League in Norwich, Connecticut. We had great basketball players, but we fought like crazy. We lost our first game, we lost our second game, we lost our third game. And after being 0-3 in the last place, I came home one night. My father had become a Seventh-day Adventist. He was looking for the true church and looked through 15 Protestant denominations, wanted to find a church that went in harmony with the Bible. And so dad accepted Jesus and accepted the message of Christ and the Bible and the Seventh-day Adventist fellowship. I came home one night from my basketball after having lost three games in a row and said to my father, Oh, Father, I am so upset. We lose, 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 lose. My father said, What you need is a good coach. I mean, you know, he knew how to bait me. What you need is a good coach. Now, my father knew nothing about basketball, but he knew a lot about boys. He was very good with boys, lousy at basketball. He said, what you need is a good coach. I said, Dad, will you coach us? Now, you, oh, you know, he was trying to hide his enthusiasm, so he said, let me think about it. You know, you've got to be wise when you're working with people. You've got to be wise. Jesus said, be wise. He said, well, let me think about it. Now, he was praying to find a way to my heart. So he began to coach us, you know. And we'd get in fights, and he'd sit us down, and didn't know anything about basketball, but he kept us kind of going. I also had a feature there because my uncle was the timekeeper and he was a good Catholic, an Irish Catholic, James Humphrey, and didn't understand these principles at all. So he was the timekeeper at the basketball court. So I knew if the game got close, my uncle would hold the clock until we scored and then make the game over. So, so I wasn't worried about that, you know, but we weren't close enough for so many games, but we got close. We're behind by one point. 
I looked at my uncle, and he just winked at me. He said, Mark, you make a basket. This game's going to be over. You're going to win one game. So I made a basket. The game was over, see. Second game, the same thing happened. We won two in a row by my uncle holding the clock till I made the last basket. See? I mean, it was good to have your uncle as a timekeeper in those days, but I didn't know Jesus and didn't know anything about that. My father kept working with me, working with me, working with me. We ended up so that we were in fourth place, and that meant we went to the city playoffs, and they came on Friday night. The Sabbath. And my father was a Sabbath keeper. I was not a Sabbath keeper. I was kind of a heathen. And uh, so my father came to me and he said, Now, son, I am going to be home tonight studying the Bible because from sundown Friday night to sundown Saturday night, I keep the Bible Sabbath. Now, I know you don't understand the Sabbath. And he said, Son, do the best you can. And when you've finished, come home and tell me about it. I remember I played that game, played that game, and we won. My uncle didn't even have to hold the clock that time. And I remember in the, I had a quart, a dime in my pocket. And I ran to the telephone. I had to tell my father, you see. Called him up. And he didn't say, it's Sabbath. I don't want to hear anything about this. He had made his stand. And I knew that he would never come to the game on Sabbath. But I also knew that he had a boy that he wanted to win for Christ. Fishing season came. My father didn't care for fishing that much. But he said to me, Mark, you want to go fishing. The fishing season for trout this year begins on Sabbath. You go to early Mass on Sunday. I'll pick you up after Mass. We'll go fishing together. And in those days, I went to early Mass, 615 Mass. 615 was the shortest Mass, you see. Only lasted 30 minutes. The other one's 45. I couldn't handle 45. could handle 30. You know, I don't want to be in church anymore. First time I went to an Adventist church, I thought those people were crazy. They went 930 in the morning. They didn't get out until 12 o'clock, you know. Whew, that was the longest I've been in church in my life. You know, went to early Mass. Now when I preach at 11 o'clock, I say, don't feel we're going to be done by 12, folks. You want to be done by 12, get another preacher. I don't care whether your microwaves are set or not. When I get finished, I'm done. I'm done, you know. But anyway, I would go trout fishing with my father. He'd say to me, Mark, you go to early Mass on Sunday. But he was always working on me. But I listened. And the reason I listened is because he was so interested in me. People will listen to you if they know you love them. Amen. They'll listen to you. So if you want to win that husband, you want to win that wife, you want to win that son, you want to win that daughter, begin to pray that God will help you find something they're interested in. Something they're interested in. If they think every time they see you, here comes a walking Bible that's going to knock me on top of the head, they're going to run the other direction when you come. They're going to run. But if you can create an atmosphere of love, John Wesley believed in what he called pervenient grace. Now, once I got a hold of that concept, it dramatically helped me in witnessing. And here's what the concept of pervenient grace is. It says this, that in every life, sometime, the grace of God is going to work. Whoever that person is, in every time in their life, the grace of God is going to, sometime in their life, the grace of God is going to work. So your work and mine is to look to see where God's grace is already working and plant the seed. When you are working with a neighbor, a husband or a wife or a working associate, constantly create an atmosphere where the Spirit of God can work. But watch for the Spirit's working. And when you see the Spirit working, move in. That's what we call the green light principle. Now, if you're driving down here down the road and the light is red, what should you do? I don't ask, what do you do? I ask, what should you do? I know you, Adventist. You're always in a hurry. Boom! You know, you're going, you know. Talking about the work will be finished rapidly. See all these Adventists driving on a road 80 miles an hour, you know, <laughs> speeding all over the place. Okay, what should you do at a stop sign if it's red? What do you do? Stop. You stop, okay? If the light is yellow, what do you do? Speed up and go through quick before the police come. No, you don't do that. Okay, if it's yellow, what do you do? You're cautious. If it's green, what do you do? Keep going. Here is the green light principle in witnessing. As you're praying for that son or daughter, 
as you're reaching out like Jesus did to the woman at the well and caring, remember, you can only share if you care. You have to earn the right to be heard, particularly in working with your loved ones and your relatives. The deeper you care, the more the opportunity will be to share. And as you're praying, you understand this, that in every life there will be a time when that heart is open. And you don't want to miss your opportunity. You don't want to miss your opportunity because it may not come around again for years. When you see somebody opening and the Spirit of God opening their heart, you begin to work sharing a little bit more and sharing a little bit more. The green light principle says this. If as you're working with a son or daughter, they become resistant. If as you're working with a husband that doesn't know Christ, they become resistant. If you're working with a neighbor and they become resistant. If you're working with a working associate and they become resistant and the light turns red, do not continue your witnessing process. The relationship is more important at that point. Because if you sever the relationship, you'll not have an opportunity to witness. So, if the light turns red, you back up, take a step backward, continue to reach out in love, say very little. If the light is yellow, keep proceeding, but proceed with caution. But when you see that green light, when that 17-year-old daughter who's not been to church in three years, comes home one night at 11.30 and she is crying in the bed. And you go up and you sit on the edge of her bed and you reach out and you put your hand on her shoulder and you say, honey, is everything okay? You want to talk about it. Is everything okay? And she sobs and says, mom, my boyfriend just broke up with me. You know, that must be tough. And you listen. And you let her cry and you talk to her and then you simply say, I know that Jesus has a plan for your life, that you're a very special girl. I knew it from the time you were born. And I know he loves you so much. And I know even if this guy leaves you, there's somebody else for you because you're too special for God. And you talk to her gently and tenderly and then you say, you know, could I pray for you? And you don't pray a prayer like this. Dear Lord, you know, she's without there tonight and she knows she's going with all these guys. And uh, if she'd stop that business, you know, you could bless her. Stop that kind of praying. You don't pray like that for your kids. You make them worse if you pray like that for them. You pray, dear Lord, thank you for my lovely daughter. Thank you that, you, that, that deep within her heart I know she wants to serve you. And Lord, she's feeling kind of sorrowful tonight. Give her your peace and give her your joy, you see. You pray positive prayers. And you watch what God does. God begins to work. You have a working associate. And you look for the green light. See, my wife is like that. My wife is the most amazing person when it comes to witnessing. Three of her last four hairdressers have been baptized as Seventh-day Adventists. I mean, amazing experiences that she has. One day, when my son was little, my wife came home and she said, Mark, I just took our son to the barber shop. And you need to go down there. The, the barber is open. You have to get a haircut. I said, dear, look, I got my haircut last week. She said, I don't care. This barber is open now. You've got to go and get a haircut. So she, I said, how do you know? She said, he's talking about the book of Revelation. She said, the light is green. You're always talking about that green light principle. Go get your haircut. I said, all right, dear, I'll go get my haircut. So I went down there and there were three barbers. And she said, it's the young guy with the longish hair. So the old guy got done first and he said, can I serve you? I said, uh, no, no, thank you. Uh, I'm waiting for that man over there. Do you know him? Well, uh, um, not quite, but I heard he was good barber. See, So the guy says, OK. Then a woman was cutting hair. She comes over. You're next, sir. Uh, no, I'm waiting for that guy over there. Uh, oh, uh, are you one of his regular customers? Uh, no, but I hope I will be soon. Uh, so. He comes up and I sit down and I'm reading the newspaper. As I'm reading the newspaper, you know, I say something like this. Boy, there's some scary things in this newspaper today. There's crime. Uh, there's war. My, did you look over here? There was an earthquake. Man, there are some scary things in it. He said, boy, if you think the newspaper is scary, you should read the book of Revelation. This morning. <laughs> That's what the barber said to me. <laughs> he said, I knew, I knew because of what my wife was telling me. He said, you know what? The other night I read the book of Revelation. He said, all those beasts, the beasts coming up out of the sea. He said, you think the newspaper is scary. Revelation's ten times more scary. I said, my, that's something. Tell me about what you read in Revelation. So he started telling me about all this stuff, you know, that he read. And he said, you know anything about Revelation, sir? 
I said, well, I read the book once or twice. And uh, I said, you know, it, it could seem scary the first time you read it, but um, did you read the end of it? You know, unless you read the end of the book, you're not going to know much about it, where God wipes away all tears from your eyes and there's no more sickness, sorrow, death. He said, that's in there. Yeah, that's in there. That's in there. And um, I, said, he, I said to him, you know, would you, would you like to know some more about Revelation? Maybe we can get together sometime. Now, notice the way you phrase things when you're working together. You always leave the crack open for them to deny with dignity. See, If you back people into the corner, what, what, what do people feel like when they're backed into the corner? See, So I don't say to him, hey, I'll come by and study the Bible with you. No, I say, hey, you think maybe you'd like to get together sometime? See, maybe, possibly, you'd like to get together. Give them a little freedom. And he says, well, you know, uh, uh, maybe we could do that. And I said, look, why don't you give me your number and I'll give you a call and we can get together. We began a series of Bible studies. I had a series of evangelistic meetings in that city and ultimately he was baptized. And uh, all because my wife was sensitive and recognized that he was open to the gospel. I was in North Carolina with a physician friend of mine running a medical retreat. And after the retreat, he said, let's go out to eat. And we were in a salad bar going through line, and a lady came up to me, and she recognized me from It Is Written Television, and she said, are you Mark Finley with It Is Written Television? I said, yes, I am. And she said, um, my, I watch your program all the time. And I just noticed in the way she said it and the look in her eyes that she was going through something sorrowful. So I reached up and put my hand on her shoulder and said, you know, I just wanted to tell you today that sometimes in life we go through some very difficult experiences but there's a God in heaven that loves you and really cares for you. And if this happens to be one of those times for you, I'm not sure whether it is or not, but if it is, I just want you to know that, that God really cares. Two months later in my office in California, I get a letter. The lady said, Pastor Finley, I cried for an hour all the way home in my car. She said, you don't know what those three words meant to me that day in, that meet, in the restaurant. <laughs> that woman was open that day. God opened her heart and mind that day. So first you prayer, then you care, then you share. So it's praying. See, I changed the word from praying because it didn't rhyme. Praying, caring, and what? Sharing. That is the method. I'm on my knees praying for my son, praying for my daughter, praying for my neighbor, praying for my sister, praying for my brother. On my knees praying. Then my eyes are sensitive to what's going on in their life, trying to show a care for them. Somebody said anybody that is wrapped up in themselves must be a very small package. The reason there are so few soul winners is because so many people have so many problems, they can't look out of themselves to see other people's problems. So many people are so wrapped up in themselves. Yes, question. I don't know that text. <laughs> I would, you see, I've heard of people that pray that way, thinking that if somebody is miserable, they may turn to Jesus more quickly. I don't know of any, um, when you look over the Apostle Paul's prayers, he says, I'm praying that your faith be strengthened. I'm praying that you grow in the joy of the Lord. I'm praying, so to pray that somebody would be miserable I, I, I'm a little hesitant about that, I'm more than a little hesitant, a lot. I think it would be logical to say to a person, what is very hard for parents particularly to say, to pray this prayer, Lord, do whatever it takes with my kids to lead them to you. That is, because all of us desire the best for our children. All of us want them to have a life of health and joy and prosperity. But to simply, honestly, before God, bear our souls and say, Lord, do whatever is necessary. I would be willing to go that far. But to pray that one would be miserable, I think what that does is it superimposes my will upon the will of God. It says that the only way that person can turn to you is if they indeed are miserable. But that may not be reality at all because the Lord may have a thousand ways to reach them that we don't know anything about. So... First, it's praying. Second, it's being caring. And thirdly, it is sharing. 
Now let's talk a little bit about sharing. Our class is going to come to a close. This has been a very abbreviated class. In the area of sharing, I tend not to like to give people, most people, large amounts to read initially. What I've found is that if you give them a lot to read, a huge book like Great Controversy or a book that is 700 pages, it so chokes them. You can choke a baby on those Adventist gluten steaks. Is there anything wrong with gluten, those Adventist vegetarian steaks? Are you going to feed some Adventist vegetarian gluten steak to a kid six months old? You choke that poor baby. What's wrong with the kid? They can't eat our gluten, you see. That you give them too much too soon, right? So what I find that I like to do when I'm working with people is in starting them out in their spiritual life, I'll read an article and I'll underline it. Maybe there's an article, maybe I'm working with somebody that I know is going through divorce and the article happens to be on how to find joy in your life or how to find peace. I'll underline something that I can say, you know, Mary, I read this article the other day and I really thought it was so neat and I just wanted to give you a copy of it and she can read the article. Um, a short book, uh, something that will begin to whet their appetite. Then ultimately I say to them something like this. There a, comes a point when that spiritual nurture develops and I might say something like this. You know, in my own spiritual journey, I've really gone through quite a journey in my own life and there was a time in my life where I was looking for real answers and there were a lot of questions that I had, questions such as how do you really find peace of mind and how can you be free from guilt? Questions such as what, how is the world going to end and uh, what about the coming of Jesus? Questions such as what happens five minutes after you die? And questions such as what is heaven really like? And you know, as I began to study the Bible, I found some answers to those questions and you know, we've been talking for the last month or two about spiritual things. We've been praying together, and I'd love to be able to sit down with you and share some of these things in the Bible. So what I often do is raise questions with people. They desire to answer them, and then we answer those from the Bible. Now, many of you have my little book, Studying Together. Are most of you familiar with this book or not? How many of you are not familiar with Studying Together? Okay, let me tell you a little bit about Studying Together. Studying together came about with, as the result of my wife. My wife was studying the Bible with scores of people, and before she would go out to study with them, she would say, Mark, write down all the texts on a given subject. And I would write down the text on that subject. And she'd take these little pieces of paper and put them in her purse. Well, finally, she said, Mark, you've got to take all those little pieces of paper and put them into a booklet. So let me tell you about studying together, because I really like it a lot myself. Studying together is divided into three parts. The first section is approximately, the first 87 pages are 30 different Bible studies, like a Bible study on the second coming of Christ, a Bible study on the Sabbath, a Bible study on the state of the dead. For example, you can open it to page 28 and you'll find that there's a Bible study on the Sabbath. Now, the neat thing about it is, when you get done with your Bible study on the Sabbath, what if a person says to you, well, the Apostle Paul declares, let no one judge you regarding the Bible Sabbath. Isn't Sabbath keeping unnecessary? It says that in Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Then I give you all the Bible texts and the Bible answer to that. Then somebody says to you, what about Romans 14, verse 5? One man esteems one day above another. Let every man esteem every day alike. All the answers to that. So after each Bible study, there are the questions that people ask you regarding that study. If you give a Bible study on hell, what about the rich man and Lazarus? It's right there. So the first 87 pages of the book are 30 different Bible studies and then the questions that people ask you on that study. The center part of the book is practical Christianity. Bible studies on how to get answers to prayer, how to discover truth. You're talking to a young person, how to have guidance when you make a decision, um, how to increase your faith, how to handle temptations, how to deal with bitterness, anger, and resentment. That's the first part of the book, how to overcome depression. The last part of the book looks at every major denomination. It's called Understanding Churches, Denominations, and Religious Groups. And there are almost a hundred pages Okay, the Baptists. What's the history of the Baptists? What do the Baptists believe? 
What doctrinal beliefs do Baptists have that are the same as Seventh-day Adventists? What are the major doctrinal misunderstandings of the Baptists, such as the secret rapture, the immortality of the soul, and what are the Bible texts to meet them? You have the same thing about Jehovah Witnesses. What do Jehovah Witnesses believe? What's their background? What's their history? What, how do you work and witness to a Jehovah Witness? What about a Hindu, if you meet a Hindu? What do you say to a Hindu? What do Hindus believe? Um, what are approaches to the Hindu mind? What about a Muslim, if you meet a Muslim? What should you say? What shouldn't you say? Um, we talk about the Muslim faith, and, uh, and uh, there's one no God but Allah and Mohammed the Apostle. How do you reach Muslims? What do they believe? What do you have to avoid when you work with Muslims? So what we have done is we've taken Mormons, quotes from the Mormon books, Lutherans, Pentecostals, how do you deal with the gift of tongues in 1 Corinthians 14. So what we have done is put an encyclopedia in one little book you can stick in your pocket so that just as you go into that home, we are finding thousands and thousands and thousands of lay people that are using this booklet to study with their friends and neighbors. It's not a Bible encyclopedia, but it is short, it is brief, so first you pray that God will help you to find somebody that's open. Secondly, you begin to show caring and love and tenderness to that person. Thirdly, as the opening takes place, you get a resource like this, a series of Bible lessons, and you gently begin to share. And God begins to open hearts and God begins to open minds. And what God will do through you is just you know, I've begun to say no to lay people more and more recently. I'll be at a place and the lay person will say to me, Pastor, can you come visit so-and-so? I think you could convince them. And I look at them and smile and say, What about you, brother? Why should I have the joy of seeing them led to Christ when I know Christ wants to use you to do it? What about you, sister? God wants to use you. The gifts that you have have been given to you by God. Amen. It is no accident that you were born in this hour of earth's history. In the drama of destiny, you could have been born a hundred years ago, five hundred years ago, seven hundred years ago, a thousand years ago. You did not choose to be born right now. But God knew that you would be born at this hour of earth's history. You didn't have to be sitting in this chapel today, but God brought you here. Amen. And in the drama of destiny, God brought you upon the scene of this earth's history at this hour because there's somebody, there is somebody that you can reach that nobody else in the universe can reach. An angel can't reach them. I can't reach them. The pastor can't reach them. The conference president can't reach them. The reason you were born at this hour of earth's history is because God knew that you have the unique ability in caring, in love, in kindness, in compassion, in sharing to reach somebody that nobody else could reach. And the purpose of life is to find those people that God brings across your pathway to witness to that nobody else can reach and to share with them the joy of living with Christ forever. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, teach us to pray for others and intercede for them like Jesus did. Teach us to care for others and to love them. Teach us that by loving them, we don't necessarily condone everything they do, but teach us to love them as human beings, to get our arms around them. Teach us to be more interested in them than trying to get them interested in us. Teach us to talk about others and not ourselves. Teach us to get the focus of attention on others and not ourselves. Teach us to love deeply like Jesus did. And Father, at the right time, help us to share the Word of God. And help us to see God's Word powerfully at work in other lives. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart. And love that soul through me. 
and as the song says, that I may do my part to win that soul for thee. In Jesus' name, amen. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. This is a digital recording for optimum sound quality. International copyright, all rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations, or for a free catalog, please call toll-free, 800-233-4450. International calls dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministry.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. You can trust ACM. There's no compromise here. If American Christian Ministries have been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with the speakers and volunteer workers to encourage you. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He is coming soon.